Hi, Grandma here. I'm reading Call of the Wild, and it's Chapter 2, The Law of Club and Fang. <clears throat> Before I begin, I'll let you know that I have a cold, so I may have to stop from time to time, take a drink. I may cough a little bit. Anyway, <clears throat> The Law of Club and Fang. Now, if you recall in Chapter 1, um, he learned about the law of the club and the fang, which the law of the club is that the uh, master would beat him senseless if he didn't uh, stop attacking. And the law of the fang is, uh, you know, watch out for the dog next to you. Uh, you don't want to make him angry or he will come at you with his fangs. <clears throat> so far in the book, the main character is Buck, and he has uh, three dog friends, Curly, Dave, and Spitz, and they have been acquired by Perrault, Perrault and Francois, who are French Canadian. And <clears throat> they, the, uh, the four dogs who are acquired will be joining other dogs in um, a dog team. The pictures from the original book, um, showing the glaciers, snow drifts, and one of the things that uh, surprised Buck was snow. He had never been in snow before. He didn't know what it was. So he's going to have to do some adapting. Buck's first day on the Daya Beach was like a nightmare. Every hour was filled with shock and surprise. He had been suddenly jerked from the heart of civilization and flung into the heart of things primordial. No lazy, sun-kissed life was this, with nothing to do but loaf and be bored. Here was neither peace nor rest nor a moment's safety. All was confusion and action, and every moment life and limb were in peril. There was imperative need to be constantly alert, for these dogs and men were not town dogs and men. They were savages, all of them, who knew no law but the law of club and fang. He'd never seen dogs fight as these wolfish creatures fought, and his first experience taught him an unforgettable lesson. It is true, it was a vicarious experience, else he could not have lived to profit by it. Curly was the victim. They were camped near the log store where she, in her friendly way, made advances to a husky dog the size of a full-grown wolf. Though not half so large as she, there was no warning, only a leap in like a flash, a metallic clip of teeth, a leap out equally swift, and Curly's face was ripped open from eye to jaw. It was the wolf manner of fighting, to strike and leap away, but there was more to it than this. Thirty or forty huskies ran to the spot and surrounded the combatants in an intent and silent circle. Buck did not comprehend that silent intentness nor the eager way in which they were licking their chops. Curly rushed her antagonist, who struck again and leaped aside. He met her next rush with his chest in a peculiar fashion that tumbled her off of her feet. She never regained them. This is what the onlooking huskies had waited for. They closed in upon her, snarling and yelping, and she was buried, screaming with agony, beneath the bristling mass of bodies. So sudden was it, and so unexpected, that Buck was taken aback. He saw Spitz run out his scarlet tongue in a way he had of laughing. He saw Francois swinging an axe spring into the mess of dogs. Three men with clubs were helping him to scatter them. It did not take long. Two minutes from the time Curly went down, the last of her assailants were clubbed off. But she lay there limp and lifeless, in the bloody, trampled snow, almost literally torn to pieces. The swart half-breed standing over her and cursing horribly. The scene often came back to Buck to trouble him in his sleep. So that was the way. No fair play. Once down, that was the end of you. Well, he would see to it that he would never go down. Spitz ran out his tongue and laughed again, and from that moment, Buck hated him with a bitter and deathless hatred. 
Before he had recovered from the shock caused by the tragic passing of Curly, he received another shock. Francois fastened him upon an arrangement of straps and buckles. It was a harness, such as he'd seen the grooms put on the horses at home. And as he had seen horses work, so he was set to work, hauling Francois on a sled to the forest that fringed the valley and returning with a load of firewood. Though his dignity was sorely hurt by thus being made a draft animal, he was too wise to repel. Uh, rebel. <clears throat> he buckled down with a will and did his best, though it was all new and strange. Francois was stern, demanding instant obedience, and by virtue of his whip, receiving instant obedience. While Dave, that's one of the dogs, who was an experienced wheeler, nipped Buck's hind quarters whenever he was in error. Spitz was the leader, likewise experienced, and while he could not always get at Buck, he growled sharp reproof now and again, or cunningly threw his weight in the traces to jerk Buck into the way he should go. Buck learned easily, and under the combined <clears throat> tuition of the two friends, Francois made remarkable progress. Ere they returned to camp, he knew enough to stop at hoe and to go ahead at mush, to swing wide on the bends and to keep clear of the wheeler when the loaded sled shot downhill at their heels. Three very good dogs, Francois turned Perrault. That buck, him poor like hell. I teach him quick as anything. Well, one of the things about Buck that they probably don't know, they see him as, you know, St. Bernard, is that his mother was a Scotch Shepherd. Well, Shepherd dogs are very intelligent. So Buck has the the large sides and the, the, the heavy fur of the St. Bernard, but he has the intelligence of his uh, mother, who was a Shepherd. By afternoon, Perrault, who was hurried to be on the trail with his dispatches, returned with two more dogs, Billy and Joe, he called them, two brothers and two huskies both. Son of the mother that they, though they were, they were as different as day and night. Billy's one fault was his excessive good nature, while Joe was the very opposite, sour and introspective, with a perpetual snarl and a malignant eye. Buck received them in comradely fashion. Dave ignored them while Spitz proceeded to thrash first one and then the other. Billy wagged his tail appeasingly, trying to make peace, tur turned to run when he saw that appeasement was of no avail, and cried, still appeasingly, when Spitz's sharp teeth scored his flank. But no matter how Spitz circled, Joe whirled around on his wheels to face him, mane bristling, ears laid back, lips writhing and snarling, and eyes diabolically gleaming. The incarnation of belligerent fear. So terrible was his appearance that Spitz was forced to forego for the disciplining him. But to cover his own discomfiture, he turned about the inoffensive and wailing Billy and drove him to the confines of the camp. By evening, Perrault had secured another dog, an old husky, long and lean and gaunt with a battle-scarred face and a single eye which flashed a warning of prowess that commanded respect. He was called Solex, which meant the angry one. Like Dave, he asked nothing, gave nothing, expected nothing. And when he marched slowly and deliberately in their midst, even Spitz left him alone. He had one peculiarity which Buck was unlucky enough to discover. He did not like to be approached on his blind side. Of this offense, Buck was unwittingly guilty, and the first knowledge he had of his indiscretion was when Solex whirled around at him, slashed his shoulder to the bone for three inches up and down. Forever after, Buck avoided his blind side, and to the last of their comradeship had no more trouble. His only apparent ambition, like Dave's, was to be left alone. Though, as Buck was afterward to learn, each of them possessed one other, even more vital ambition. 
that night, but faced the great problem of sleeping. The tint, illumined by a candle, glowed warmly in the midst of the white plain. And when he, as a matter of course, entered it, both Perrault and Francois bombarded him with curses and cooking utensils till he recovered from his consternation and fled ignominiously into the outer cold. A chill wind was blowing that nipped him sharply and bit with a special venom into his wounded shoulder. He lay down on the snow and attempted to sleep, but the frost soon drove him shivering to his feet. Miserable and disconsolate, he wandered about among the many tents, only to find that one place was as cold as another. Here and there, savage dogs rushed upon him, but he bristled his neck hair and snarled, for he was learning fast, and they let him go his way unmolested. Finally, an idea came to him. He would return to see how his own teammates were making out. To his astonishment, they had disappeared. Again, he wandered about through the great camp looking for them, and again he returned. Hmm, were they in the tent? No, that could not be, else he would not have been driven out. Then where could they possibly be? With drooping tail and shivering body, very forlorn indeed, he aimlessly circled the tent. Suddenly, the snow gave way beneath his forelegs and he sank down. Something wriggled under his feet. He sprang back, bristling and snarling, fearful of the unseen and unknown. But a friendly little yelp reassured him and he went back to investigate. A whiff of warm air ascended to his nostrils. And there, curled up under the snow in a snug ball, lay Billy. He whined placatingly, squirmed, and wriggled to show his goodwill and intention, and even ventured, as a bribe for peace, to lick Buck's face with his warm, wet tongue. Another lesson. So that was the way they did it, eh? Buck confidently selected a spot and with much fuss and waste effort proceeded to dig a hole for himself. In a trice, the heat from his body filled the confined space and he was asleep. The day had been long and arduous and he slept soundly and comfortably, though he growled and barked and wrestled with bad dreams. Nor did he open his eyes till roused by the noises of the waking camp. At first, he did not know where he was. It had snowed during the night, and he was completely buried. The snow walls pressed him on every side, and a great surge of fear swept through him, the fear of the wild thing for a trap. It was a token that he was harking back through his own life to the lives of his forebears, his ancestors. For he was a civilized dog, an unduly civilized dog, and of his own experience knew no trap and so could not of himself fear it. The muscles of his whole body contracted spasmodically and instinctively. The hair on his neck and shoulders stood on end, and with a ferocious snarl, he bounded straight up into the blinding day, the snow flying about him in a flashing cloud. Ere he landed on his feet, he saw the white camp spread out before him and knew where he was, and remembered all that had happened from the time he went for a stroll with Manuel to the hole he had dug for himself the night before. A shout from Francois hailed his appearance. What I say, the dog driver called to Perrault, that buck for sure learned quick as anything. Perrault nodded gravely. As a courier for the Canadian government, bearing important dispatches, he was anxious to secure the best dogs, and he was particularly gladdened by the possession of Buck. Three more Huskies were added to the team inside an hour, making a total of nine. <clears throat> Excuse me. And before another quarter of an hour had passed, they were in harness and swinging up the trail, the Daya Cannon. Buck was glad to be gone, and though the work was hard, he found he did not particularly despise it. He was surprised at the eagerness which animated the whole team, which was communicated to him, but still more surprising was the change wrought in Dave and Solix. 
They were new dogs, utterly transformed by the harness. All passiveness and unconcern had dropped from them. They were alert and active, anxious that the word should work should go well, and fiercely irritable with whatever by delay or confusion retarded that work. The toil of the traces seemed the supreme expression of their being and all they lived for and the only thing in which they took delight. Dave was wheeler or sled dog. Pulling in front of him was Buck. Then came Solex. The rest of the team was strung out ahead, single file to the leader, which position was filled by Spitz. Um, okay. Here's a picture of what the dogs look like. And their position, show, they have different jobs that they do depending upon where they are in the, in the um, lineup. But all of this harnessing and their position in the dog sled, it's called the traces, and it is a hierarchy. The best dogs are here in the front. They are the leader dogs. And so Buck and the other dogs are further back in the team. So Spitz has a special uh, position, and that's why he acts so assured of himself is because he knows he's in the leadership position. <coughs> anyway, here's another picture of the dog sled team. And the idea, this is the wheel, and their main job is to pull the sled. And this is the team, and this is where Buck is and most of the, the new dogs. This is the swing dog, and this is the lead dog. Um, well, we'll refer to these later because uh, this all plays an important part in the, in the story. Uh... I forgot where I was. Buck had purposely placed between Dave and Solex so that he might receive instruction. Apt scholar that he was, they were equally apt teachers, never allowing him to linger long in error and enforcing their teaching with their sharp teeth. Dave was fair and very wise. He never nipped Buck without cause, and he never failed to nip him when he stood in need of it. At Francois, uh, Whip backed him up, Buck found it to be cheaper to mend his ways than to retaliate. Once during a brief halt when he got tangled in the traces, that's the harnesses, delayed the start, both Dave and Solix flew at him and administered a sound trouncing. The resulting tangle was even worse, but Buck took good care to keep the traces clear thereafter and ere the day was done, so well had he mastered his work, his mates without ceasing uh, his mates about ceased nagging him. Francois's whip snapped less frequently, and Perrault even honored Buck by lifting up his feet and carefully examining them. It was a hard day's run up the cannon through sheep camp, past the scales and the timber lines, across glaciers and snow drifts hundreds of feet deep, and over the great Chilkoot Divide, which stands between salt water and the fresh, and guards forbiddingly the sad and lonely north. They made good time down the chain of lakes, which fills the craters of extinct volcanoes, and late that night pulled into the huge camp at the head of Lake Bennett, where thousands of gold seekers were building boats against the breakup of the ice in the spring. Sleep of the exhausted just but all too early was routed out in the cold darkness and harnessed with his mates to the sled. That day they made 40 miles, the trail being packed, but the next day and for many days to follow, they broke their own trail, worked harder and made poorer time. As a rule, Perrault traveled ahead of the team, packing the snow with webbed shoes. Now this is a picture of Francois, but he is wearing snowshoes. And that's what uh, Perrault uh, used to pack the snow so it'd be easier for them to uh, run. Francois guiding the sled at the G pole, sometimes in them they have a pole on the right-hand side, which is the G side, and they use that to steer the sled and keep the sled behind the um, animals. 
sometimes exchanged places with him, but not often. Perrault was in a hurry, and he prided himself on his knowledge of ice, which knowledge was indispensable, for the fall ice was very thin, and where there was swift water, there was no ice at all. Day after day, for days unending, Buck toiled in the traces. Always they broke camp in the dark, and the first gray of dawn found them hitting the trail with fresh miles reeled off behind them, and always they pitched camp after dark, eating their bit of fish and crawling to sleep in the snow. Buck was ravenous. The pound and a half of sun-dried salmon, which was his ration for the day, seemed to go nowhere. He never had enough and suffered from perpetual hunger pains. Yet the other dogs, because they weighed less and were born to this life, received a pound only of the fish and managed to keep in good condition. He swiftly lost his fastidiousness, which had characterized his old life. A dainty eater, he found that his mates, finishing first, robbed him of his unfinished ration. There was no defending it. While he was fighting off two or three, it was disappearing down the throats of the others. To remedy this, he ate as fast as they, and so greatly did hunger compel him, he was not above taking what did not belong to him. He watched and learned. When he saw Pike, one of the new dogs, a clever malingerer and thief, slyly steal a slice of bacon when Perot's back was turned, he duplicated the performance the following day, getting away with the whole chunk. A great uproar was raised, but he was unsuspected, while Dub, an awkward blunderer who was always getting caught, was punished for Buck's misdeed. The first theft marked Buck as fit to survive in the hostile Northland environment. It marked his adaptability, his capacity to adjust himself for changing conditions, the lack of which would have meant swift and terrible death. It marked further the decay or going to pieces of his moral nature, a vain thing and a handicap in the ruthless struggle for existence. It was well enough in the Southland under the law of love and fellowship to respect private property and personal feelings, but in the Northland under the law of club and fang, whoso took such things into account was a fool and insofar as he observed them, he would fail to prosper. Not that Buck reasoned it out. He was fit, that was all, and unconsciously he accommodated himself to this new mode of life. All his days, no matter what the odds, he had never run from a fight. But the club of the man in the red sweater had beaten into him a more fundamental and primitive code. Civilized, he could have died for a moral consideration, say the defense of Judge Miller's riding whip, but the completeness of his decivilization was now evidenced by his ability to flee from the defense of moral consideration to save his hide. He did not steal for joy, but because of the clamor in his stomach, hunger. He did not rob openly, but stole secretly and cunningly out of respect for club and fang. In short, the things he did were done because it was easier to do them than not to do them. His development, or retrogression, was rapid. His muscles became hard as iron, and he gave callous to all ordinary pain. He achieved an internal as well as external economy. He could eat anything, no matter how loathsome or indigestible, and once eaten, the juices of his stomach extracted the least particle of nutriment. His blood carried it to the farthest reaches of his body, building it into toughest and stoutest tissue. Sight and scent became remarkably keen, while his hearing developed such acuteness that in his sleep, he heard the faintest sound and knew whether it heralded peace or peril. He learned to bite the ice out with his teeth when it collected between his toes. And when he was thirsty and there was a thick scum of ice over the water hole, he could break it by rearing and striking it with stiff forelegs. His most conspicuous trait was an ability to scent the wind and forecast it at night in advance. No matter how breathless the air when he dug his nest by tree or bank, the wind that later blew inevitably found him to leeward sheltered and snug. 
And not only did he learn by experience, but extincts, long dead, became alive again. The domesticated generations fell from him. In vague ways, he remembered back to the youth of the breed, to the time the wild dogs ranged in packs through the primeval forest and killed their meat as they ran it down. It was no task for him to learn to fight with cut and slash and the quick wolf snap. In this manner, he fought forgotten ancestors. They quickened the old life within him and the old tricks which they'd stamped into the hereditary of the breed were his tricks. They came to him without effort or discovery as though they had been his always. And when on the still cold nights he pointed his nose at a star and howled long and wolf-like, it was his ancestors dead and dust pointing their nose at the star and howling down through the centuries through him. And his cadences were their cadences, the cadences which voiced their woe and what to them was the meaning of their stiffness and the cold and the dark. This is tokens of what a puppet thing life is. The ancient song surged through him and he came into his own again and he came because men had found a yellow metal in the north and because Manuel was a gardener's helper whose wages did not lap over the needs of his wife and divers small copies of himself. So basically what is happening is he is hearing the call of the wild and he is becoming wild again. Okay, that's all for today. Bye-bye.